Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and I'm so glad that you're joining us as we investigate episode five of Apple TV's Masters of the Air. Our previous episode was an episode of transition. Major Clevin has gone missing. This creates a pall of uncertainty within the 100th Bomb Group. And we also see the arrival of new up-and-coming officers who are soon to play a major role in the fate and destiny of this bomb group. So let's head back to 1943 and take a look at Episode 5 of Masters of the Air. Bremen was the toughest mission of the war for me. The October 8th, 1943 mission to Bremen was indeed a memorable one for Harry Crosby and the rest of Everett Blakely's crew. Um, after the plane dropped its bomb load, I mean, the flak just eviscerated the aircraft, and the, the pilots had no other option but to put their ship into a dive to extinguish the flames, uh, which were coming from the number four engine, I believe. Uh, and then German fighters attack as their descent continues. The plane is so low that it heads over a small village and they say that there's actually like policemen and farmers shooting at them from the ground level, which is something that they had never experienced before. They then plan to ditch the plane into the channel when they get closer to England, but Crosby <laughs> accidentally blew off the hatch when the crew was dumping its gear so they couldn't ditch after all, so they had no other choice but to navigate to an abandoned base in England. And sure enough, when they did land, they hit the single tree um, that was on the whole airfield. So it was some tough luck, but it was luck nonetheless. Can we help you? Yeah, we can start by getting the hell out of our wrecks. Where's my locker, huh? It's a common thematic feature in a lot of these airborne movies to have the the empty the empty bed the footlocker left behind and of course this is symbolic of men who will not be returning to those beds uh, but here uh, Crosby and his team uh, do return when they were anticipated not to after being several hours late, and this is what Crosby has to say about that. If a plane crash landed at another base or ran out of fuel and had to belly in somewhere, its pilot knew he should phone in that the crew was still in action. In our case, there had been no phone at Lidham. That was the airbase where they landed, which had been abandoned. When we walked into the Quonset hut in the 418th site, our beds were stripped. My radio and record player were gone. My picture of Jean was gone. My footlocker was gone. On the bare cot were two clean sheets and two pillowcases, two blankets, one pillow, all neatly folded, ready for the next crew. So you really had a sense that this assembly line of carnage continues and old crews disappear and new ones come in to replace them. What the hell you got in your locker you're so worried about? I got more fucking robberies than I can count. I sure as hell don't need my mom to count them, huh? Crosby likewise expressed how people were concerned about what might be shipped home in their footlockers if they did not return. When a crew went down, they too disappeared. Two hours after a crew failed to show up, the adjutant and first sergeant rushed to the missing crew's quarters, took down the pictures, and moved out everything that belonged to them. The adjutant removed anything incriminating, like letters to and from the wrong woman, or lewd pictures, or condoms. Then the possessions were sealed for eventual return to the MIA's family. We did not talk about such crews. It just wasn't done. So while Doug here was expressing concern about all the rubbers, more than he could count, um, these sort of staff sergeants and clerks and whatnot, they had the tendency and the good discretion to try to remove anything indelicate from footlockers before they were sent home, but nonetheless, a sigh of relief that his character has here. Holy shit, it's Blakely's crew. Jesus, we thought you bought it. <laughs> they reported four shoots out of your ship. 
this triumphant, though surprising return was something that was vividly in Crosby's memories for many years onward, and he likewise describes it in his book, A Wing and a Prayer. Colonel Harding drives up in his sedan, with Bucky Egan behind him in another car. A volley of words. We thought you had it. We got reports that four shoots got out. Did you see Bucky Clevin get it? We take the enlisted men to their quarters. Since we have not eaten since this morning, we need food. We look at our watches. 1930 hours. The flying mess will be closed. We head for the officers club. As we enter, officers, ground and air alike, look up, stunned. It's Blakely's crew. Pandemonium. Every man in the club, even the enlisted waiters, rushed up and pound us on the back. At least half of the other offers us drinks. We thought you bought it. They reported four shoots, they repeated. Did you see Major Clevin blow up? Bucky Clevin, the impervious, the invincible, was gone. If he couldn't make it, who could? His good friend, Bucky Egan, didn't talk much that night. Although, he would vow revenge. And certainly, um, things weren't going to become any better in these coming days, which is now known in the history books as Black Week for the U.S. 8th Air Force. In his memoirs, Crosby said that the red light signal being shown here meant that a mission was impending and you pretty much had to drop everything that you were doing. Um, but meanwhile, John Luckadoo, also of the 100th Bomb Group, uh, kind of recalled it the other way around, that a green light meant a mission was a go. But in any case, uh, Crosby said that he never had the chance to finish watching a movie. Uh, during the war because it seemed like they were always being interrupted. And uh, as a, a fun cultural side point here, uh, I think the movie that they are watching is Who Done It, which is a 1942 Abbott and Costello comedy. Uh, if I'm wrong, let me know in the comments section below. You sure I'm the right man for this? No. <laughs> this sentiment is true to form. Of course, as we've seen in previous episodes, and as we can very much get a sense of from his writings, Crosby is a very humble man. He is self-deprecating. He hardly ever believes that he is up to task. And so this question of, are you sure I'm the right man for this job, this conversation that he has with Jack Kidd uh, is attested to in his book. And ultimately, when he accepts the responsibility, Crosby recalls walking into this large central room that we see depicted in here, and he said it was like walking onto hallowed ground uh, because he realized the gravity of this responsibility being placed upon his shoulders. And he said it was a, a flurry of activity. It was an ant farm of bureaucracy, that there was this 20-foot high wall, 50-foot wide map of Western Europe uh, that was located in this room, and it really gave him a sense of the scope that was to be associated with his job as group navigator. We saw how close that cathedral is to the MPI. We're hitting it right when everyone's coming out of mass. We've never had a target this close to oh, the Senate. Jesus before. Christ, Frank. It's a war. Although it may seem difficult for us to believe, many airmen in the 8th Air Force took pride in believing that they weren't killing civilians, or at least not as indiscriminately as the RAF's so-called city busters. Um, but this view changed to an extent on October 10th, 1943, when U.S. airmen were directed to set their aim on the steeple of the cathedral in Munster, Germany, at, at noon, no less, on a Sunday when people were going to be leaving the building. Um, interesting, Munster was home to some of the critics of Adolf Hitler, including the bishop who was present there at the time, Bishop von Galen, um, who actually 
stood up and denounced a lot of the Nazis' oppressive tactics. Um, so there were, uh, not everybody was a fan of Hitler in this community. Uh, so that's something ironic to take into consideration here. But um, according to one article with the National World War II Museum, there was, there was some mixed reaction to the men in the 8th to, in regard to bombing Munster. And this offers some insight on that. John Kima, a bombardier with the 390th Bomb Group, said that that really didn't sit well with the crews. It was a totally different concept from what we were always taught. I wondered, what the hell are we doing? Ellis Scripture, lead navigator in the 95th Bomb Group and a deeply religious man, questioned the order. He approached his commanding officer and said he was very reluctant to fly this mission and explained his reasons. Colonel John Gerhardt responded, Look, Captain, this is a war, spelled W-A-R. We're in an all-out fight. The Germans have been killing innocent people all over Europe for years. We're here to beat the hell out of them, and we're going to do it. When threatened with court-martial if he refused to fly, Scripture reluctantly agreed and flew his mission. Even more appropriate to the scene that we just saw here, other men had different reactions than Kima and Scripture. Major John Egan of the 100th Bomb Group was ecstatic at hearing the order. When he heard the target, he found himself cheering. He said, Others who had lost close friends in the past few raids joined in cheering because here was a chance to kill Germans, the spawners of a race hatred and minority oppression. It was a dream mission to avenge the death of a buddy. Um, we can see right here that this sort of moral boundary is crossed and there is less distinguishing between armed combatants and manufacturers and civilians. Uh, pretty much what Egan is saying here, that this is an enemy race and we must annihilate them accordingly. And so it brings us to some of the cold truths and realities of fighting the air war. This is such an impressive shot. I, I love these zoomed out angles, so to speak, because once again, you just really get a, a sense of scope um, as well as, as these guys are unfortunately heading into the meat grinder once again. As the, the B-17s are heading into the Roar Valley here, we get a glimpse of the P-47 fighter escort that was intended to protect the formations for much of the journey, but yet a, a navigation mistake occurred and the fighters were late in linking up with the heavies and in consequence, having already expended most of their fuel, the Thunderbolts soon had to turn back and that left the fortresses wide open to perhaps an inevitable Luftwaffe assault. Jesus! How much coffee did you have this morning? This rather comical moment of an airman relieving himself reminds me of an anecdote shared by my co-author John Homan as we wrote the book Into the Cold Blue, which you can find information about in the caption below. And uh, this is what he had to say about relieving oneself while in transit. Dilemmas of the bladder and bowels were universal. Pilot Will Plate of my bomb group explained the complicated relief process when the urge grew acute. As we worked our way through the many layers of clothing, the frigid air reached the sought-after area before we did, and the object of the search went into hiding behind our hearts, he remembered. After considerable coaxing, the natural stream began, only to be halted by an inundated frozen tube in which he was urinating. Plate had no other option but to stop mid-flow and await his return to base. From then on, he and his co-pilot placed reused bomb fuse cans beside their cockpit seats as makeshift urinals. And matters grew even more complicated when you needed to do a number two, 
And there's another comical story that you can find in the book that I'm not going to share right now. But uh, suffice it to say, they had to get creative in these moments of natural urgency. Two weeks after this mission, Harold Clanton's parents in Tulsa, Oklahoma, received the, the dreaded Western Union telegram indicating that their son had gone missing in action. And it wasn't until the following May that they learned that Harry had in fact died over the skies of Munster. So they went seven months without knowing their son's fate. And of course, so many other families never learned the outcome of their loved ones. This is one of the great tragedies of a war this large. But in any case, Clanton's remains were returned to Tulsa in 1949, and he rests today in Memorial Park Cemetery. At the time of his death, he was 21 years of age. Jesus. Fire is 12 o'clock. Something that I was a little bit overly cynical about at the outset of this series as we were assessing some of the depictions of combat, I said that some of the German fighters almost looked like fighter jets. You know, it, it looked like they were going too fast. But then um, after some people reminded me otherwise, and after I revisited some of my conversations with John Homan, I in fact realized how fast they were going. After all, these planes are approaching at uh, incoming speeds, or closing speeds rather, of 600 miles an hour. And so, and it, when you read uh, the book of John Lucky Luckadoo, the book about him, uh, of course, you know, he says that they uh, came and went in an instant. Uh, just like that. So yeah, I, I really do get the sense that this is an accurate depiction in regard to the speed. And uh, certainly the scale here as well is accurate because some 200 Luftwaffe planes charged these fortresses that day in what one witness called the most violent and concentrated attack that he had ever seen. I think indeed that this is the correct way to bail out. Unlike what we've seen in a lot of other high altitude war movies, if you will, you can't just yank your chute as soon as you're out of the plane. Um, you might have to be in free fall for a mile or two, otherwise you'll die of anoxia. Uh, once the cord is pulled, airmen often absorb this like horrific vista that was engulfing them as they descended to earth. I mean, this was truly terrifying stuff. And perhaps just as terrifying is what might be awaiting them on the ground. And so I, I suspect we'll see what happens to Egan in that realm as the next chapter unfolds. Bombs away. Right on target. These marshalling yards, these vast staging areas for German railroads were really vital targets, even into the final months of the war. The problem was that these yards and these industrial plants were often located within or on the periphery of major cities. So when these vast plain formations were even slightly off target, residential areas were inevitably going to be struck. But Naturally, uh, some instances of these mass killings were quite purposeful. We're pretty much told as much during the briefing scene depicted in this episode. Shrapnel is indeed a vicious thing. And I, I have several pieces of shrapnel uh, from my collection. Um, this piece is actually something that we recovered from the Hurtgen Forest on one of our battlefield expeditions, but of course it's very similar to the stuff that was exploding and splintering in all directions over the flag filled skies of Europe. And um, even 80 years onward, 
uh, this is still, it still has these sharp, jagged edges. And oh, I can only imagine what it was like seeing and feeling and, you know, kind of being on the receiving end of this. Um, so um, it, grim and tangible artifacts as such. Uh, it's a real testament to the lethality of these circumstances. For any of you who are curious, this tune that Rosenthal is humming is called The Chant by musician Artie Shaw, which you should look up and listen to yourself. Um, but these are the sorts of things that Rosenthal would do to try to keep his men calm under these really tense circumstances. This guy was a true leader. And uh, to make this little scene even better, this may be my favorite scene in this episode. Um, Rosie was really a sort of connoisseur of music. He was a very cultured individual. And so this is just a great personal touch used with a period tune. Uh, but on, on a more serious note, uh, Rosie flies three missions during this week that is known as Black Week. And it's little scenes like this that go to show that you had to try to find a silver lining somehow. You had to try to keep your spirits boosted just for a little bit, if not for yourself, then, th then for your fellow crewmates. Well, some might claim that the use of slow motion in shots like this is chintzy, it's a war movie cliche, whatever. I know for a fact that pilots had surreal moments like this one that we see depicted here. When, when time seemed to stand still and you were acutely aware of everything that was unfolding around you. Um, when you witnessed something traumatic, or saw pieces of a plane raining down, or saw an enemy airman just yards away, that caught your attention in an almost deer-in-the-headlights sort of style. Uh, so I, I don't think that this is overdone at all. I've read many accounts attesting to this sort of perspective. Here they come, Billy. I see them. Straight ahead. Take maneuvers. I've grown curious about these British kids who are always hanging around the hard stands with lemons, and I was pleased to find out that at least one of them is a real person uh, who was a, a young nine-year-old boy by the name of Sam Hurry, a <laughs> good and appropriate name for him. And uh, he would be running around the base in his knickers and befriending uh, pilots and ground crew, and he almost became an informal mascot of sorts. And I found a wonderful newspaper article from 1992 that described what this place meant to him. And so once again, this is from 1992, and the article states, Hurry, still short and pixie-dyed at 58, helped restore the base at Thorpe Abbotts and organize a reunion weekend. And so this kid, as he grew into an adult, um, he was fundamental in helping to preserve and interpret Thorpe Abbotts as a shrine of sorts to the 100th bomb group. This place was my childhood, Hurry responded, when asked why he had de devoted so much of his life to returning the base to life. My mother, my aunt, and the woman next door did laundry for the Americans. We boys did the pickup and delivery, walking a mile and a half each way with our handcart. For the whole war, we practically lived on base. We didn't even go to school. Hanging around here, I got a better education, didn't I? How do you repay these people, the lucky ones who are still here, he asked. For the men of the 100th, the reception here this weekend was beyond imagining, despite the cloudy skies and frequent showers. So, a fine little bit of nostalgia 50 years onward that we hear about here. When I get you home, Lauren. 
your heart just aches as you see this crippled aircraft and its mangled crew being evacuated out of the plane. And you see that 2,000 yard stare on Rosenthal's face. But uh, specific to this scene, um, the Associated Press soon had something to say about Warren and his recovery in the immediate aftermath of this raid. And this is what this article from the Associated Press indicated. Sergeant Warren F. Darling of Sac City, Iowa, received the Silver Star when decorations were presented yesterday to crewmen of the Flying Fortress Rosie's Riveters. Air Force officials disclosed that Rosie's Riveters was the only bomber of its unit to return from the raid on Munster, Germany, last October 10th. Darling's ship hit Munster all alone and limped home on two engines. So the article here was a little bit mistaken. They weren't yet flying Rosie's Riveters, at least not for this mission, um, but it's referring to the crew, rather, of Rosie's Riveters itself. What about Eager? After interrogation. Hey, Frank. Later, Kenny. All of them? Several planes from another group had indeed landed at Thorpe Abbott's, and this made everybody on the ground grow incredibly tense. And when all soon realized that most of the planes of the 100th were not coming back, uh, Ken Lemons later recalled this in his memoir. No more followed. She was the only one to make it back, speaking of Rosenthal's plane, of course. We stood staring at the empty sky in stunned belief willing more airplanes to appear. It was like being kicked in the stomach. I looked around the field at all the empty hard stands, remembering the activity of the morning, where just a few short hours ago the field had been teeming with men in activity, ground crews and flight crews preparing for the mission. Now there was only emptiness. The grain blanket of weather served to make the scene all the more silent and eerie. Ground crew and officers alike stood dumbfounded, trying to take in the reality of this nightmarish impossibility. Despondency descended on Thorpe Abbott's with the thickening fog. In one hellish afternoon, the 100th had all but been obliterated. It was nearly unthinkable. Someone somewhere at Bomber Command had calculated that if any group lost two-thirds of its total crews, it would be unable to recover and the remaining crews would need to be dispersed to other groups. Our boys proved them wrong. If any doubted the metal of the 100th, they would not do so for long. They can't make me go up again. I won't do it. I'm not gonna do it. These declarations as such were commonplace. Um, my friend John Homan's nose gunner on his B-24, for instance, had had plexiglass sprayed in his face three times on three different missions. And after that third occasion, the gunner declared, I'm not getting back in that damn thing. But uh, generally, these sentiments were simply ignored in a fashion very much like we see in this scene. And the men simply continued their work. Tail 23229, Pasadena Nina. Ronald? Anyone? This is around the time that the 100th started to become known as a, a cursed outfit or a jinxed bomb group. Um, the level of attrition here was just unfathomable. Um, losing 12 out of 13 aircraft or the like on a mission like this, um, even for a lot of units that really went through the ringer, this was considered to be almost an inconceivable rate of loss. Bubbles paid. Navigate it. No record. So is Bubbles Pain truly gone? I think one of the really effective things about this series is that characters are coming and going, and you'll have no idea if they will reappear. Uh, were they shuffled back from resistance forces in Europe? Were they isolated somewhere? Are they prisoners of war? Will they make it back? Are they dead? I think how the audience is thrown into limbo here is very effective filmmaking from a historical standpoint. But um, in regard to Bubbles, stay tuned. I suspect we'll, we'll find out what happens to him in some of the future episodes. But as to Crosby, 
at this time, he was actually on a one-week leave when the Munster mission occurred, but that's not to say that he wasn't staying in the loop, as he attests to in his memoir. And this is what he had to say as he was on leave. We arranged a code for me to telephone and get a report on what's happening. At 1600 hours from Louise's office, I phone the base. I get Captain Fry. Did all my friends get back from pass, I ask. No sound. I know something is wrong. He is trying to figure out how to break the bad news. I come in quick. Did some of them have a permanent change of station? Yes, all but one, was the reply. All but one? That means that maybe 20 planes got shot down. The weatherman breaks the code. Egan's gone. Your old crew is gone. The whole group is gone. The only one who came back was that new crew in the 418th. They call him Rosie. I drop the phone. I can't believe it. Brady, Ham, Davy, and her, all gone. Crookshank, gone. Old Southern boy Murph, gone. All my friends, every crew who went through training with me in the States, is gone. I tell Blake and the crew, they say nothing. They just look at each other. Okay, says old beady eyes, R&R &R is over. Let's go home. One truly gets that, that sense of loss, and for those who remain, that sense of isolation that follows. And I think to their credit, uh, the directors of this episode, Anna Bowden and Ryan Fleck, what they sought to achieve here in episode five was to treat this episode almost like it was a horror film. And I heard as I was doing a little bit of research on this episode that they actually played music from The Shining in the cockpit sets before shooting to help set this eerie mood for the actors as they were preparing to film some of these heavy scenes. And I think it works. I think it pays off that sense of eeriness that pervades, especially as we get to the end. That covers everything for this special episode of Real History. Thank you once again for joining us as we explore Masters of the Air. If you haven't done so already, we always appreciate you clicking that subscribe button below. We also welcome you to visit the website of the 100th Bomb Group Foundation, which has just mountains of wonderful historical materials on these characters and missions. And once more, I also invite you to check out information on my book, Into the Cold Blue, which I authored with B-24 co-pilot John F. Homan. I don't think you'll be disappointed. We'll see you next time on Real History, and until then, stay curious.